all the founders of quantum mechanics, Einstein, Bohr, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, Dirac, even Feynman, all assumed that waves and particles go in the same direction. It never even dawned on them that this was an assumption. It just seemed obvious to them. Not any of them, none, ever asked the question, do the empirical data support this assumption? They never looked at the experimental evidence with this question in mind. On this video, we will examine some empirical evidence and we will ask the question whether the data are more consistent with the idea that waves and particles go in the same direction or in opposite directions. The particular experiment in question is one by Kaiser Clothier Werner et al., published in Physical Review A in 1992. So the question before us is whether the data from this particular experiment are more consistent with this idea or this idea. I will present here a brief overview of this experiment. More details can be found in my website lwave.org or you can read the original publication from 1992. The 1992 publication contains many experiments, but the one I'm focusing on is the one in which they take neutrons obtained from a nuclear reactor and feed them into a box, which is an interferometer. Now inside the box there are two silicon blades, blade A and blade D. Blade A divides the stream of neutrons or neutron waves into an upper stream and a lower stream. In blade D, the two streams are combined where there is wave interference. Now I say that there is wave interference in silicon blade D, but why? The reason is because there is a phase shifter, an aluminum plate that can be rotated or pivoted back and forth by the experimenters located here. The effect of the aluminum plate pivoting is to shift the phase of one wave versus the other. Now that won't affect anything as long as they're separate from each other, the upper path and the lower path, but when they get back together then it will cause interference because if the two waves upon joining each other in plate D are in this relationship, then the peak of one wave adds to the peak of the other and the valley of one wave adds to the valley of the other and you get tall waves. If then they shift phase to this, then the peak of one wave wipes out the valley of the other and you get almost no waves. And then as they continue to shift phase, you get tall waves, no waves, tall waves, no waves. The neutrons or neutron waves then go down and are recorded uh, by a detector. Now bismuth is a metal, a material, which slows down neutrons or neutron waves. It slows it down. So therefore, if they put a sample of bismuth, as they do, into the upper pathway of this interferometer, the upper path of neutrons or neutron waves is slower than the lower path, progressively depending on how much bismuth is used, which is between 0 and 20 millimeters of bismuth. So if they put more and more bismuth into the upper pathway, the upper wave packet, if you think of a wave packet, is slowed down and arrives at silicon blade D later than the wave packet from the lower pathway. As it progressively is slower and slower because of more and more bismuth, there comes a time when the lower wave packet has already departed from silicon blade D and there is no more wave interference when uh, the upper wave packet arrives there. All this is recorded, as I said, in the detector. So what you see from the point of view of the detector is that when there is no bismuth, the detector finds 
lots of uh, interference as evident by very tall sinusoidal waves. As you put in more and more bismuth, the waves get smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually at 12 millimeters or more of bismuth, all waves disappear. There is no more evidence of wave interference. So that's the first part of the experiment that was published and so far it kind of makes sense. It's consistent with the idea that neutrons and neutron waves are traveling in the same direction at the same time, uh, perhaps as a wave packet. In the next part of the experiment, things get wild. We're going to focus on this detector down here, which is recording how much interference had previously taken place inside the box, inside the interferometer. Now, as I say, with enough bismuth up inside the interferometer, all interference has died out, and this detector is showing us uh, no more sinusoidal waves, no more interference. But let's then insert in front of the detector a, a analyzer crystal. This is a near perfect uh, piece of silicon crystal. Actually it goes like this, but my hands can't go that way very easily. We're inserting this analyzer crystal here, which should actually have no effect on the interference if things were the way we had thought they were with wave packets, with, with wave particles. It turns out that when we insert this analyzer crystal outside the box and before, uh, before uh, and upstream from the detector, the full force of, of sinusoidal curves reflecting interference is restored, which makes no sense. We take the crystal away, all the, interference uh, all the interference disappears. We put the crystal back, all the interference reappears. Now how can this be? It makes no sense. So what do the experimenters say about these weird results? Well, they don't know how to explain them. They say so. Uh, they chalk it up to quantum weirdness or to uh, Wheeler's smoky dragon so to reiterate, the problem is, which way are the waves going? If the waves are going in this direction, as in the case of wave-particle duality, as assumed by quantum mechanics, then the interference occurs inside the interferometer, which is upstream from the analyzer crystal and upstream from the detector, and therefore there's no way that something happens downstream can affect what previously occurred upside, upstream inside the interferometer. The analyzer crystal is outside the interferometer. The only way that could happen, if wave-particle duality is true, is backwards in time cause and effect, which also makes no sense. So what does an analyzer crystal do? What, what's its effect? Well, I will tell you what it does and what it does not do. What it does is it takes the beam of neutrons, and which, which has a certain spread of wavelengths, and narrows it, focuses it, so that it's more intense, sharper, in a narrower area. What it does not do is rescue the idea that waves go in the same direction as particles in this experiment. Now let's change our starting assumption. Let's consider how this experiment would look if the waves started at the detector and went in the other direction. In this case, the, the detector and the analyzer crystal would be upstream from the interference, so it would be much easier to explain, simple to explain, how uh, changes down here could affect the interference. Now if the waves are going in this direction, we have to think of the interference as not being located in silicon blade D, as we previously thought, but rather inside silicon blade A. So if there is no 
analyzer crystal and we're adding more and more bismuth the upper wave packet or the, the upper wave there's no wave packets in this theory the upper wave gets slowed down relative to the lower wave and eventually uh, all wave interference inside silicon blade uh, A disappears. If we then add the analyzer crystal its effect is to narrow the band width and sharpen and make more intense the neutron beam. The beam uh, becomes much more penetrating and is easily able to penetrate through a full 20 millimeter sample of bismuth and therefore all the wave interference inside silicon blade A would of course be restored. Now as you recall we are trying to figure out whether the experimental data uh, from this particular experiment are more consistent with the idea that waves and particles go in the same direction or in opposite directions. Uh, we found that the idea when we look at the data the idea that they go in the same direction doesn't doesn't make sense but does the idea that they go in opposite directions make sense? We're now considering that latter possibility and we've kind of solved the problem of cause and effect. I mean the cause being the presence or absence of an analyzer crystal down here uh, is upstream from the effect which is the presence or absence of wave interference so that's better but we still don't have a neutron. So this is where this theory gets weird. I mean neutrons are our window into the world of waves and without some particle like that we can't see or detect the waves. So a wave having departed silicon blade A goes up into the nuclear reactor where it connects with an atom as it decays and connects with a neutron. Now how do they connect? We don't know. Why would a neutron follow a wave backwards? We don't know except that the waves are the pathways and that's the only way that particles move around is by following these pathways backwards. So the neutron comes down and goes through the interferometer following its wave with a probability of one. The wave is the trajectory and it goes down to the detector which then clicks and it clicks in a pattern which allows us to see what was previously going on with the interference of the waves. So what we have are two explanations and the question really is uh, which, which is worse? I mean neither of them is all that great. Uh, the first one which is the waves and particles go in the same direction no one can figure that one out at all. It makes no sense. The, the other explanation that they go in opposite directions only makes sense if you're willing to make a whole bunch of very strange assumptions that would be new to you most likely, uh, which is that a wave f triggers the, the atom to decay and emit a neutron and follow the wave backwards. So, I mean, let's, let's think that out. How could that possibly be? I mean, where do these waves come from? The, the detectors, from which apparently is the origin of the wave, is not emitting any, any particular energy. Well, the next step in the logic is that you have to postulate that there are waves, which we call elementary waves, everywhere. Everywhere in nature there are elementary waves of all wavelengths going in all directions. Now that might be a strange assumption, uh, but it is the assumption that, we, that I think flows from this experiment. It does mean that you're living in a very different world than you thought you were living in. You'll notice that with this explanation of the experiment we cannot say that the neutron is in a superposition of states nor can we talk about wave function collapse. Those concepts just don't fit. It appears that in this experiment the neutron is always a particle. It always has a position, a trajectory, a momentum. 
All the founders of quantum mechanics assumed, as I said, that waves and particles go in the same direction. When we look at experimental data, at least this experimental data, we find that this explanation of the data it just doesn't hang together, it doesn't make sense. The alternative explanation it doesn't make that much sense either, but at least if you make some complicated assumptions about the nature of the world, you can spin a coherent story. Now what does that mean? I think what it means is that wave-particle duality is wrong. I agree with Louis de Brol, who said that there is a wave aspect to all matter, all physical matter. But that does not mean wave-particle duality. I mean, it can't if waves are sometimes going in the opposite direction as particles. What it means, in my view, is that there are waves and there are particles and they interact. The history of science is the history of proving or discovering that that which appears to be obvious is not true. In this case, it seems obvious that waves and particles travel in the same direction. In this particular experiment, at least this one time, it appears that that is not true. Thank you for your time and attention.